I'll give you my opinion first. I don't see how it's possible that he didn't cheat. These days, speed running is an umbrella term that covers more ground than you might think. From the classic struggle between gamer and timer, to reprogramming old school consoles with soldering iron in hand, to pure streaming entertainment. And all of these different kinds of speedrunners play together in relative harmony. But it wasn't always that way. No one really knew what they were looking at. The real-time community had been playing Super Mario Bros. 3 for a number of years and had known records, but this exceeded anything that had ever been shown before. The real-time runners immediately knew that there had to be something going on here. They knew there was cheating. It's as if someone decided to participate in the Olympics without, without admitting that they were doping. Cheating, cheating, cheating. You could just make a run that wasn't legitimate and just have that video there. I've seen people that come to my chat that even uh, tell me that kind of stuff. They're like, hey, you just clipped through the pyramid with a bomb. Like, that's allowed? Whether it was cheaters being exposed, folks falsely accused, or anything in between, the early days of speedrunning were rife with drama. And perhaps no single event was more destabilizing than the inception of tool assistance. It also serves as a striking model of how humans interact with tools and technology, and points to a fascinating future trend for us and our games. This is the inside story of the civil war that almost blew up speedrunning. Modern speedrunners like Dream enjoy YouTube channel subscriber bases in the tens of millions, and even Twitch streamers that don't strictly style themselves as speedrunners, take Ninja for instance and his audience of roughly 17 million fans, focus on an overlapping set of skills that any speedrunner would find familiar. The kind of skills that elevate a run to the status of a magic trick completely break a game, or get you all the way through Dark Souls in under an hour or Ocarina of Time in eight minutes. Yet, when we dig a little deeper, we find that speedrunning and streaming are not exactly the same. And even within speedrunning circles, there's a rich mix of different approaches, from hacker to athlete to entertainer to glitch hunter to charlatan. I think it was maybe controversial in the YouTube comments scene where people stumble upon a task video, see that it's not actually being done by a human, and they immediately assume, well, this must be cheating. You know, this isn't fair at all. It was a problem because it seemed like someone was trying to pass off a total cheat as human effort when the reality was much more complex and nuanced than that. To fully understand how tool-assisted speedrunning shook up the community, we'll have to go back, way back, not only to the early days of people speedrunning games like Doom and Metroid, but back to basics. What is speedrunning exactly? And more importantly to our story, what isn't it? I first learned of speedrunning around 2006 at the arcade I used to play DDR at. The manager had um, DVDs of speedrunning on the little CRT TVs up um, on the ceiling. And I remember asking about them and I was like, what are those? You know, because there were video games being played. And he's like, oh, these are Taz runs. And I had no idea what they were. Heck, you might not even know an RTA from a Taz. So let's take a second to refresh ourselves. And when it comes to a speedrunning guide, one man stands alone. So my name is Alan, AKA Cheese Alvarez. Um, I am a Twitch streamer, YouTuber, and uh, mostly known for my speedrunning. I have held many world records in Super Mario 64. I was top three once in Zelda or Queen of Time, and I've also speedrun titles like Super Mario Odyssey and Celeste. Cheese is an RTA speedrunner, probably what most people imagine when they're first introduced to the idea. He plays video games fast. Uh, well, and that brings us to RTA, which stands for Real Time Attack, which is basically the essence of actual human speedrunning. It's the act of doing a full speedrun from start to finish, and there's no tasking, no computer whatsoever. Also, it kind of refers to completing something like from a, from as as a human, right? Or like you'll hear some you'll hear people talk about like, oh, that's a segment in strat, or like that's not RTA viable. For a while, real time attack runs were all there was to speedrunning. People pitted their own strategies and reflexes against a game one second at a time, and the most efficient thumbs won. 
but gaming is more than the arcade experience, and as players began to take more ownership of the medium in the 80s and 90s with the birth of home consoles and games that you could play over and over again as many times as you wanted, a new kind of speedrunning began to feel inevitable. A kind of speedrunning that didn't just set player against machine, but let them collaborate to play with a level of skill that couldn't be matched without the machine's cooperation. Along came TAS, or Tool Assisted Speedrunning. Here's Alan Cecil to explain exactly what that means. Tool-assisted speedruns, or sometimes tool-assisted superplays, refers to any time you're adding a tool to your gameplay. It might be as simple as using the scroll wheel on your mouse to map to uh, auto-fire or some other technique where you're using a human control in a different or unexpected way the game designers didn't anticipate. At the other more extreme area of tool-assisted speedruns is where you're using the ability to see into memory, see every bit of the state of the CPU, back up in time, rewind, try again. This can lead to speedruns far more spectacular than an RTA runner could ever accomplish on their own. At this point, TAS runs have become so popular and varied, Alan and his team have even created a mascot who inputs all the commands into a console required to perform tool-assisted runs on original hardware live. In other words, they made this robot who plays Super Nintendo better than you. His name is Tassbot, and he's a handy symbol for all that Tass entails, including a sometimes mystifying degree of complexity that can throw even the most experienced runners. When I first saw Tassbot, I didn't, I had no idea what it was, to be honest. Um, I still kind of don't know what it is, <laughs> if I'm gonna be honest. I'm Duango AC, keeper of Tassbot right here behind me. I've taken Tassbot to a number of Games Done Quick charity events where he plays video games faster than a human could possibly do. Tassbot is all about playing video games as fast as possible on a real console, whereas TASVideos.org is more focused on the creation of tool-assisted speedruns inside of an emulator, a situation where you have the ability to rewind, go back in time, try again as many times as you like, never have to worry about human skill, luck, memory, reflexes. It's like making a digital art piece where you can erase as many times as you like until you are satisfied that your work is as perfect as you can make it. So speedrunning is an art, a science, and a sport, not to mention a great way to raise money for charity. But beneath that simple definition lies the colorful history of the pastime, including when the emergence of tool-assisted runs ignited a civil war among speedrunners, the effects of which we still see today. The thing about speedrunning that is so unique, first and foremost, there's a huge nostalgia factor in speedrunning. Uh, a lot of speedrun titles, the, the most popular ones especially, are games that tend to be older, games that tend to be those that you grew up with and um, they really hit you in the heart. When you when you see somebody speedrunning a game like uh, Super Mario 64 or Super Mario Sunshine or Sonic Adventure uh, or Ninja Gaiden, these games you grew up with and you're like, wow, I can't believe I'm watching this game again. It's been so long. And then you're like, wait a minute, this person is destroying this game, what's going on? And it, it makes you really excited. And when you actually try it out yourself, it's like even more exciting. And even more so than any other sort of gaming experience I've ever had. And I think what makes speedrunning so special is that you see your progress in real time. Because you use splits and you have the times and, and, and you could literally see how fast you're improving while you're playing the game. And it makes you feel like you're getting better at something uh, quickly and it really makes you uh, motivated and uh, it's by far the best gaming experience I've ever had. It means a lot to me, you know, um, just like any other, I guess, passion or discipline that people do that they work so hard at. As the senior ambassador for TAS Videos, my job is to help people see tool assisted speedruns for what they are, recognize that it's different than human effort, it's different than just running through once with only a single opportunity beginning to end with whatever luck happens to come your way. My goal is to show this other art form where you throw away all of the human limitations and replace it with the ability to push the game and the video game console it's run on to the very limits of what it's capable of. Most often people get into tool assisted speedruns because they saw something they just couldn't believe. A lot of people see their first tool assisted speedrun without understanding what they're looking at and they become fascinated with how perfect or 
insane gameplay is. It's really easy to grab an emulator, grab your favorite game and play through it a little bit, experiment with the ability to go backward in time, and as you start to get used to the process of making a tool-assisted speedrun, add in extra things like pausing the game and advancing one frame at a time. For the Titanfall 2 task, for example, uh, we actually slow the speed that the game runs at down to, you know, about uh, 0.25. So it runs at about a quarter of the speed. And then we're still performing all the inputs like humans are. But obviously when you can slow the game down that much and we have a script that'll do perfect jumps for you, for example, we have a script that calculates the, 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 perfect, uh, the perfect speed to be turning your camera at. You know, so we, we have these external tools that are assisting the speed run. And then when we play the game back at full speed, you know, it looks like what the game would look like if it were played to, uh, you know, you know, perfection. If real time attacks turn games into a sport, tool assisted speed running turns the same games into an engineering problem. Even two accomplished speed runners like Cheese and Allen value speed running for very different reasons and come at it from two very different angles. Speed running or gaming, competitive gaming in general, it's a form of sport. It is a sport. That's why it's called eSports. And that takes time and practice. You gotta practice the game hours a day, practice the movements, practice the first stages, the easy stages, get used to the movement, get used to the feeling of, 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 of the mechanics in general. That's the, the core of the science part. The art part comes after, which is 85 to 90% of the actual experience and time in speedrunning, uh, which is the mindset. That's what the art form is. Um, and mindset is never ending. You always have to work on your mindset. I've been speedrunning for seven years. I'm still working on my mindset. It's a never ending process. Um, and that's the hardest part by far because that's where the emotions come in. And controlling and handling emotions and understanding and your emotions is how you don't quit at the end of the day. It's how you actually become great at something. An RTA runner needs the ability to play through a game perfectly in one shot. That means reflexes, memory, routing, recognizing exactly where they're going, consistency in how they're playing. A real-time runner has one shot through the game to get it right. And they might try tens or even hundreds of thousands of times before they get a run that has everything come together. A tool-assisted speed run requires a completely different set of skills. It requires patience, the willingness to go back and experiment, the ability ability to know when you have to throw work away. It's the hardest thing you have to do when you've found a new improvement early in your run and you have to throw away everything you've done for the last several months. There are people who use tool-assisted speedrun techniques to play games in ways they wouldn't be able to otherwise because they happen to be differently abled gamers. A tool-assisted speedrun allows them an infinite amount of time to play the game however they like, take different branches and experiment with glitches try things in ways where there's no consequence for failure. Other people are interested in making tool-assisted speedruns because they want to see something perfect, a video game they cherished from their childhood, and they just want to see it absolutely destroyed. As Alan explains, some of the earliest tool-assisted speedruns were done on games like Doom, Quake, and Super Metroid. But in the case of Quake, the player's ability to record themselves and splice multiple runs together birthed a whole new kind of speedrunning. TAS was born. In the beginning were games like Pac-Man, where all you could do was gain points. Donkey Kong was another example. The best you could do was play through the game and get as many points as you possibly could. In the 1990s, games like Super Metroid came out that had an in-game timer that would show you the completion time at the end of the game, challenging you to see if you could play it just a little faster. That led to an entire community of people ultimately ending up on places like Speed Demo's Archive, trying to play games as fast as they could. Another branch of real-time speedruns happened in the 90s through Doom and Quake, which had built-in movie formats that allowed runners to record their time. This also led to the first tool-assisted speedruns when people figured out they could slow the game down and play it in slow motion and repeatedly load save states to allow them to play the game better than they would on just their own human skill. That was a way of doing a super-segmented run. Neat, right? 
Unfortunately, there was no way to inform everyone that TAS had been born. So, a lot of people's first introduction to the concept of a tool-assisted speedrun was like cheeses. It's funny because most people who get into speedrunning, the first thing they see is our TAS videos on YouTube. And they're like, who is TAS and how on earth are they doing this? This is crazy. You know, and it happened to me. Uh, the first video I saw was a TAS uh, video, Super Mario 64, zero star TAS in five minutes, whatever. And I uh, thought, what? Beating the game with zero stars, first of all. In five minutes, second of all. Third of all, who's TAS? So, you know, that's the natural reaction. Open the video and I see this in insane stuff and I mean, it literally felt like I went from zero to a hundred because that's what it is watching a task video. It's not knowing about speedrunning to seeing the fastest possible speedrun you could see in one of, your, one of your favorite games. So that was a huge shock. I called my brother because me and my brother both grew up gaming together. And he was like, oh my God, what is this? The second recommended video uh, right after that one was Narcissa writes, I think it's all dungeons, all Queen of Time speedrun in AGDQ 2012. And it was the first RTA speedrun that we saw. Uh, and then we realized, oh, this is, this is, th these are two different things. TES is not a, it's not a human. And what happens when a bunch of humans find out robots are doing their sport at a rate of proficiency they could never hope to match? You guessed it, Discord! TAS videos and runners initially suffered under the stigma of being perceived as RTA runners who were trying to cheat. To make matters worse, there is such a thing as cheating at speedrunning. People try to do it all the time. But when it comes to the confusion around TAS and drama that followed, there's maybe no better example than an infamous 11-minute run of Super Mario Bros. 3. It's our gateway into the messy world of early speedrunning. Let's -a go. I think a lot of it comes down to people not understanding uh, the whole point of things like tasking. And for good reason. There just weren't that many around. Until about 2003, very few people had actually seen a tool-assisted speedrun. And the concept wasn't even given a proper name, in some cases just called a time attack, often without enough context to allow viewers to understand what they were looking at. There was such fewer resources back then than there are now. I'd say the only downside of the um, of Taz runs is that um, the majority of the tricks or basically all the tricks are not humanly possible, which can be disheartening for runners trying to optimize their runs. But for entertainment and resource purposes, I think it's really awesome. Years ago when somebody new came into speedrunning and there was just like one video of this Taz. And there was not really a lot of explanation or anything behind that Taz either. It was easy to think like, wait, who did this and why does it have so much viewers? And it's just a bunch of glitches. The most famous example of this was Morimoto's Super Mario Bros. 3 run in 2003. There was this run of Super Mario Bros. 3 that made no sense. Mario was getting 99 lives, he was taking insane risks with piranha plants, getting multiple one-ups in a row. Everything seemed impossibly good. And there wasn't much context around the video. It was in the days before YouTube, and it wasn't necessarily obvious what was happening. The description wasn't written in English, and a lot of people who saw that run were confused about what they were looking at. Real-time runners saw it and realized that it was not possible to do that with human effort and got very, very upset. The run itself was done with tools, and if you could read Japanese, you could tell that. But the SDA community, the Speed Demos Archive community, had no idea what was going on in this run. The SDA founder, Radix, famously said, I don't have any interest in TAS runs, I don't watch them, I don't want to have them anywhere near my site. There was a lot of people who saw this tool-assisted speedrun of Super Mario Bros. 3 as disingenuous, as cheating. Actual cheating is when you deliberately represent something made with tools as human effort. And that has happened from time to time. There was someone that ran Yoshi's Island and he played back a task and kind of pretended to be playing it in real time. And I, he was discovered because he had a hand camera and he was mimicking the movements of the run with the controller. But at one point he messed up and his movements on the controller did not match what he did in the game. There were a few instances of people uh, resorting to other ways of cheating, which is like, pretending to play on stream when they actually weren't playing. Later, somebody would watch the video and realize, wait a minute, they turned right here, but his finger went left. That's 
something's wrong here, you know? But nowadays, a lot of top runs are done live and have a microphone and maybe a face cam to where you can very easily tell pretty much that someone's actually playing the game. What Morimoto had made wasn't cheating. He was playing entirely within the rules of the console and the game to the best of the emulator's ability at that time. He was not trying to cheat. He was only trying to push the game as far as it could go. This is much different than Billy Mitchell, who appears to have actually cheated and falsified records in the past. Billy Mitchell, whose Donkey Kong records were famously documented in the movie King of Kong, eventually had many of his titles stripped from him when it was revealed that he used emulated gameplay passed off as authentic hardware. But he's far from the only gamer to cheat at speedrunning. In fact, cheating has plagued the RTA and task communities since their beginnings. There were world records debunked years later um, you know, by community members that uh, and that they were faked runs. They were fake. they were spliced. In Super Mario 64, whenever you enter a loading zone or you exit a course, the screen goes entirely black for a brief period. And they seen that as an opportunity to splice a running. And this went on for years, dating back even to one of the first 16 star records on Speed Demo's archive. Until a member of the community came along and figured out a way to check if someone is splicing. They were found out by uh, members of the community using programs where they would see the sound wavelengths and they would see like cuts in the sound. In the 1980s, Todd Rogers set a record for the fastest lap time in the Atari 2600 game Dragster. That record stood as the longest standing Guinness Book of World Records video game record ever. Until... I think there was videos put out talking about Dragster and how crazy optimized it was. And it was the idea of this really short speed run of six seconds and trying to get the perfect time on it. If you take all the speed runs and get an average time, it would be maybe around 30 minutes, right? It's like an average speed run time, 30 minutes to an hour, you know? So seeing a speed run of six seconds was like, wow. Speedrunners being speedrunners and computer scientists, they, after a while, realized, wait a minute, this time is not possible. Far from being cheating in and of itself, the same tools that tool-assisted speedrunners use have sometimes been employed to catch speedrunning cheaters red-handed. OmniGamer and other tool-assisted speedrunners dissected the game and discovered that the time Todd Rogers claimed to have was impossible on the released version of the game. We also went so far as to use Taskbot to play back the fastest known run on real hardware and confirmed that the fastest time you could get was not as fast as Todd Rogers claimed. The task community was able to prove, using task tools, that Todd Rogers had falsified his record, either through falsifying the record with the referee or other technical glitchery that allowed him to pass off one number as another on the screen. Speedrunning community, of course, would not take that lightly, so there was a lot of drama behind it and, um, it was it was quite a it was quite a moment. It's funny because after all of that, it hasn't stopped. Speedrunning scandals absolutely persist to this day, and despite the strides made in educating the public, sparks still fly around contentious questions like how lucky is impossibly lucky when it comes to Minecraft. One of my most popular YouTube videos is actually a video of me reacting to Carl Jobs' video about dream cheating in Minecraft. A modern controversy that has come up is one of the Minecraft speedrun by Dream. The problem is that while it seems that it's all human effort, there's something not quite right. The math, it all makes sense. There's, I don't, he had to have been cheating. You know, the odds are just literally one in however many trillion. To me, it was like pretty obvious, right? The reality is the statistics of what he had happen are so inconceivably rare that he must be cheating, according to many in the community. The sad part is too that that, that Dream kind of just kept going with the whole thing. He made he, he he I think he hired someone, a mathematician, to literally like come up with this math and stuff to prove how he wasn't cheating and that kind of stuff. And it was crazy. Actually, spoiler alert: Dream cheated. 
Since we taped these interviews, Dream has admitted to running an altered version of Minecraft during his infamous run, although he's denied that he knew the game he was playing had been tampered with. And for most in the speedrunning community, that may be enough to earn him redemption. Once a person that cheats um, realizes that they've done a bad thing and we're not to be taken lightly, <laughs> then I guess it's fine at the end of the day, you know? Once everybody is, is, is satisfied, I'll probably forget about it in a year or so and, you know, it'll just be like, yeah, remember that one time Dream did that? Yeah, that was funny. Either way, thanks to rooting out cheaters, clearer packaging, a larger community of informed speedrunners, and tools and platforms like Twitch and Discord, the speedrunning kingdom is as vast and harmonious as it's ever been. What began as a contentious relationship between RTA runners and tool assistants has since blossomed into a symbiosis that benefits both both sides. And more and more, the line separating the two camps is getting blurry. So let's get a fix on the new normal. In 2003, when Morimoto's run of Super Mario Bros. 3 came out, there was a lot of tension between the real-time community and what became the tool-assisted speedrun community centered at nesvideos.org, which is now taskvideos.org. And I remember at the time, when I just knew of it as a concept, it seemed kind of lame to me. Because, like, you know, obviously if you're using tools and slowing down the game and going frame by frame, you know, of course you're going to get a perfect speed run. Well, what is the point of that? I believe it was AGDQ 2016, a year after I had been watching RTA speedruns. Um, I saw the Taskbot demonstration of Brain Age, which is, you know, like a math quiz game for the DS. And what the task does is like these incredible, crazy drawings and ridiculous answers that somehow still get picked up as the correct answer by the game. And at that point, I realized, okay, this is an entirely different beast than RTA speedrunning. This is, you know, like a, a demonstration of just the absolute craziest things you could possibly push the game to do. The problem was that the real-time runners could only see task runs as cheating, as fraudulent, something that seemed completely wrong to them. They saw no value in tool-assisted speedruns at all. The scene in the world today is very different. Today, real-time runners and tool-assisted speedrun authors work together to use their best skills to complement one another. Real-time runners are playing the game interactively, and they're able to think through different routes that might be possible, figuring out different paths through the game and different real-time strategies. Those real-time strategies and routes influence the tool-assisted speedruns, which then use task tools to find glitches that might then be human viable, which then influences the real-time runner to pick a different route. The cycle of a real-time runner taking their best shot at it, feeding into a task author refining it, feeding into the next iteration of real-time runs and the next generation of runners has led to multi-decade improvements in run times. Two assisted speedruns have brought a lot to the table in terms of new strategies that RTA runners have been able to implement in some cases. One of the most beneficial things as a task is it, is it shows you what's possible. They kind of both feed into each other, kind of like a circle of life type deal. And seeing how they work and how Taskbot works, it's just, it blows my mind because the lengths that people go to to create this kind of stuff in speedrunning, just because the passion that they have for it, that alone to me was, is just the most awesome thing ever. It's so admirable and it makes me care about speedrunning even more and realize how much it actually means to people. It was once said that all tools are just extensions of the human body, and the story of tool-assisted speedrunning is a great example of the way humans react to new technology. We may at first be wary or cry foul, but ultimately, if a tool proves useful, we'll use it. And once a community forms around understanding said technology and learns to police itself, the sky's the limit. Today, speedrunners of all stripes are working strats around the clock and around the globe, not to mention forming IRL bonds at an exploding number of in-person speedrunning events, both tool-assisted and otherwise. Here's Cheese talking about the granddaddy of them all, the Games Done Quick conference. The thing about GDQ is that without GDQ, so many of us would not be where we are today. And a lot of speedrunning would not be where it is today because GDQ is really what pushed the entire speedrunning community to become more together, to believe that we have a great community and platform, um, to, and also to believe that what we're doing means something. And a lot of that reason is because of the, the amount of 
money that we raise for charity, the amount of viewers that we get, the amount of joy that we see people have when we do our speed runs and the, the audience's reactions, uh, our parents' reactions, <laughs> you know? And most importantly, all the friends that we get to hang out with in real life at these live events. All of my close friends are friends that I met through speedrunning and they all live in different countries. So when you get to go out to these live conventions or events and meet them in person, that's by far the best part. Speedrunning these days is a bit like a good round of Overwatch. Plenty of different roles to go around. What's your speedrunning class? In the task community, there are some amazing glitch hunters who specialize in dissecting the game, reverse engineering how it works, and finding flaws or glitches that you might be able to use to improve your play, improve the route of the game, sequence break, or generally cause mayhem. There are also folks that are really good at the process of routing a task, figuring out the best mechanism with all of the glitches they have available of getting through a game. Those are people like Mathreus and Adelicat, who is the site admin of Tass Videos. There are other folks that do weird things on hardware like Vigray Tech and P4 Plus 2, where it's not just glitch hunting, it's glitch hunting on the real hardware, in some cases going so far as to create their own cartridges that run on the original console. There are also people who are real-time runners who also have one foot in the task community. Folks like Andrew G and Cosmic on the Mario front that both play the game in real time, but have also done tool-assisted speedrun work and have used that to find glitches to improve the real-time runs. But what does the future of speedrunning hold? And what does that say about our own humanity? When it comes to deep-level interactions between mankind and tech, how far can we go? How much can you become one with the machine? With a tool? Before we stop the clock and check our time, we've got one last level to clear. Dr. David Eagleman is a Stanford neuroscientist who spent his life studying the ways that humans relate to tools. Dr. Eagleman specializes in devices that augment human senses and extend our capabilities, like a wristband that lets you feel sound, and a vest that allows people to develop a so-called sixth sense based on vibratory patterns. And it's all about extending human capability by feeding more information to the brain because our brains are locked in silence and darkness inside of our skulls. They don't know where the information comes from. Uh, brains are just general purpose compute devices that take care of things uh, optimally to you know, change their behavior in the world. So a general thing we're doing is extending capabilities of people by capturing infrared light or ultraviolet or stock market data or Twitter data or data from a drone and you know having an having an expanded way of taking in information the applications of these sensory substitution technologies are just beginning to be explored and we're not here to say that they'll necessarily become a big part of the sport of speed running but it is interesting stuff and it helps explain the initial reaction rta runners had toward the task community so uh, this is what we humans have done from day one is we <clears throat> have very flexible brains and so we can extend our body plans and make other things part of ourselves. And so this is the part of tool use. You know, when I grab a hammer, I'm making it as though that's part of my body that I'm capable of punching nails in. Or when I jump on a bicycle, uh, my motor system learns, oh, okay, if you want to get somewhere, just turn your legs like this. And if you want to stop, squeeze your hand and so on. Anytime tools help us do something, you have the old guard that says, this is cheating. I mean, look, when the printing press was invented in the 1440s, there was a lot of lamentation about it. And people said, but this means that our children won't memorize these epic poems and be bards and you know have the, the challenge of remembering the Odyssey and retelling the story because anytime they want, they can just go pick it up. It's right there in print. And every generation actually has these kinds of complaints. Some of us are old enough to remember um, you know, the idea of using calculators in school and teachers being mad about that and so on. But the fact is that tools try to, in the best case, they make things easier for humans such that humans don't have to do all of the meaningless work to get there. Now, it may be different in this case about speed running. They're just different flavors of whether you want to do it the, uh, the John Henry way with no tools or do it with tools. Um, but certainly it's no surprise that there is 
you know, uh, much beating of the chest and crying about having tools uh, take care of something for you because that happens every time tools are introduced. So there you have it. A happy ending for the land of speed running. Plus, a real scientist to put it all in context for us. We don't know exactly what the future of speed running holds, but it's thriving like never before, and a great time to get personally involved, if you feel like trying your luck, tool assisted or not. And, um, I think that's pretty much it, yeah. <laughs>